Lots of local organisations and people work hard to preserve York's medieval heritage for now and for the future. From looking after archaeological finds to conserving buildings, people from historians to special trusts and local business owners all play their part. If somebody was to build a timber-framed um, house to this day, you would almost do exactly the same. Obviously the big difference would be that you would use modern machinery and it would be a much quicker process. But the one thing that stands out with the building of the Merchant Adventurers Hall in particular is the fact that there would have been people who would have been working on the building from the very beginning in 1357 who would have seen the building completed. This was rare of buildings of a large scale, particularly the Minster, which took 200, 300 years to build. There would have been generations of people working on that building. While here, the Merchant Adventurers Hall, people would have walked past it on the street maybe five, ten years afterwards and would have remembered actually working on it. Well, I think our work is so important because we started to preserve buildings or the original founders, which were the Moral family, they started to purchase buildings within the city and they would preserve these buildings and bring them back into use. Not only back into use as retail shops, but also they opened up the upstairs of these places for flats for people. So bringing more people into the city. This has been continued and without this trust, then many of the buildings within the city would have actually being destroyed. Is it a highly expensive process to renovate these buildings? Very much so, because when you first purchase that building, um, the best surveyor in the world will not be able to find out exactly what's wrong with it. It's only when we start to renovate the building do we find the problems with it. That's not to say that uh, there is a bottomless pit of money. But when we take on a building, we have to do the job right. And therefore, cost, although it is important, is not the most important attribute. Do you think the people of York are proud of their heritage? I'm sure that the vast majority of people are very proud of their heritage. You've only got to look around this city and wouldn't you be proud of living in a city as wonderful as this and with such a, an extensive history dating back, you know, over 2,000 years. There's various projects underway at the moment. We've just discovered that some of the stained glass is in urgent need of repair. We're saving up money at the moment. We need £1,500 initially for a condition report on the glass, a study of its current state of repair. Some of the fine early Victorian glass, which has been used to repair the windows, is degrading. And one of the 14th century windows has actually got gaps between the stained glass and the lead. So in due course, pieces may actually start to fall out. The other big project, which um, we hope to start shortly, is to pave the Lady Chapel with replica medieval floor tiles and um, to raise money for this, we've got a big grid with pictures of the tiles on it, and people are sponsoring tiles, individual tiles at 10 pounds a piece. Um, some people can't afford 10 pounds, so there's uh, around the edge, there's half tiles, and some people have bought those for five pounds each. And then we'll keep the grid so that if you come back, you can see exactly which tile you paid for. As far as we know, we've, we've repainted the, the ceiling in a colour scheme which could easily have been used in medieval times. Um, one of the, the interesting features of the ceiling, I suppose, is um, apart from the fact it's got about seven green men in it, it dates from 1472, is the coat of arms of the rector who was only here for five years, so that easily puts a date on the, on the ceiling. But instead of pointing um, towards the people in the congregation so that they could see who'd paid for the ceiling, it points east towards the, um, the altar, as if to say in, um, in medieval terms, I don't care if the people know who paid for the ceiling, so long as God can see. What's your favourite medieval landmark in York and why? 
for me, it wouldn't be one of the big monuments like the castle or the minster. It's the surprising things that you don't expect to come across. So I think the small everyday houses that have survived, such as the buildings in Great Plain or the Shambles, which give you that scale of what it was like to be alive. You know, these are the houses of the people. I think that is more striking than the big monuments. It takes quite a bit of time getting used to being in such a confined space. You've got to literally squash everything into the shelves. You've got a storeroom that's probably about the size of this area there, where you've literally got everything stacked up. And come Christmas time, you get people coming and I get up to 30, 40 people in this shop. And somebody will say, can I have a box for this, please? And it'll take me 10 minutes to get to the back and back to the front again. But, you know, it's part and parcel of, of having the shop. I used to get stressed initially. Now it's just, I tell the customer to hang on, I'll be back. If you don't see me, send for help, you know. The customers like it. I get a lot of people coming and asking questions, especially how old is this shop? It dates back to the early 1500th century with things like these beams that run across the top there that comes from an old ship that they've recycled the wood from. So the, in a sense, the, the ceiling's even older than the rest of the shop. And then if you have a, a look at the door there, you've got a door that's about two inches wider on the top than it is on the bottom. Everything is skew. You know, uh, I used to have a, a chest of drawers there that I actually took away because every time I opened the drawer, it would shoot out. In winter, all the shops around me complain about the cold. This little shop stays as warm as toast. It's the only one in the street with a stable door. So you leave the bottom door shut with sort of having a low ceiling, no windows and spotlights. It keeps it as warm as toast. I have a little heater down the bottom there and that's it. There are one or two bolts down there where you would have run a cord from. They would have had another bolt in the ceiling where they would have suspended the meat and that probably would have run along the whole length there. And you can't see it now because this window has been boarded up but the windows are actually on runners. So it moves from right to left. So they would have served all the meat out through the window. That would have been the, the counter. So nobody would have actually come into the shop. When you think about it, I don't know how anybody survived in those days. You know, apparently they used to spice the meat heavily so you couldn't taste how old it was. The most important thing I like this building, it got plenty of character, right? So the, the space may limit here, but uh, we manage it. But we got some customers come here, they sometimes they, they don't like it because they say, all right, uh, it's so small space, people getting too close to each other. But that's the, I can't, nothing I can do because the building is like that. I think it's just common sense. You go into the low building, you're supposed to bend your head. Now we put a big sign and sporting light, they say, be careful your head. You know, so end of the day, we manage this space. Some people like, some people don't like, but, but the majority of people, they like this building because of the character. And then we try not to do any, to put too much decoration, like, like Chinese restaurant, which is keep original, everything original, and the very, put a very limited decoration here. In York, we have this sort of ongoing tradition of using locally sourced natural materials. And the building we're in at the moment is a perfect example of that. Half timbered building. The timber was probably felled about uh, half a mile away. It was constructed by local craftsmen. Um, the plaster was probably dug up um, 10 miles away, shipped here. So it's natural, local materials, which are, it is the most sustainable. And, and we all know that as we get closer and closer to the time when the oil runs out, just how sustainable we're going to have to be. And some of the modern structures that you see today are not sustainable in the long term. One organisation called the York Philosophical Society, who actually own this site where we are, they helped to found something called the York Footpath Preservation Society. And they engaged a very famous artist of the time named William Etty, who also had a great love for the city, to campaign on their behalf. And it was his efforts and the efforts of this society where, where we managed to retain, for example, Bootham Bar. William Etty was able to create a, a sea change in attitude. We know that 
uh, then Lord Mayor, Lord, uh, Mr Leatham, um, managed to campaign to restore the walls because they were crumbling at the time. And so what we see today, this is this fantastic medieval defining characteristic of York, the, the longest continuous piece of uh, city walls um, anywhere. It was preserved because of those efforts in the early 19th century. I've been a director for two years now, but previously that I, I worked as the administrator for the trust um, and came into York in 1984. And actually was living or lodging very close to the Minster. And in July, heading towards where I worked, which is Fairfax House, um, I came across the south transept of the Minster on fire. And uh, it was just such a shock to my system. And I just burst in t into tears. Uh, and, and I realized that you know, these were such precious structures that we should all do everything we can to preserve and enhance. We should seek to be modern, but there's no reason why we cannot live comfortably with the past, and why we can't reuse uh, old buildings in a, in a modern way. I think for me, the medieval period has that really nice balance of today, the grandiose, the really uh, the top of the Everest pinnacle of art and architecture, but also through archaeology we start to see really what every, everybody's daily life was like because we're getting to that period where writing survives in some quantity, rubbish survives in vast quantities, particularly here in York where we have waterlogged levels so we get all sorts of bits of leather and cloth surviving directly beneath you know, the real monuments to medieval England, in effect, some of the greatest artistic material. But I think one of the really interesting things about the medieval period is where our view is coloured by that survival. And what we don't really see is the medieval world, because it wasn't bare stones and it wasn't, you know, dry material. It was all about theatre, it was about colour, it was a very exuberant way of living which we have a very sort of Victorian view of, that it's about bare stones and it's all about smelly and it's a bit baldric-like and everything else. But actually it was in a most you know, exuberant and vivid and lively place. So that's the end of our journey through York, the medieval city. We've walked the streets, explored the buildings and spoken to everyone from historians, curators and local people. We've learned that it's important to preserve and celebrate our heritage so it can be enjoyed by people today and for years to come. <laughs>